All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. It is Wednesday, October 12th, 2022, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in as well. So I wanted to talk about this topic here because uh, I'm going to teach uh, my online class, uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And um, I wanted to talk about this article that we've talked about before, but this deals with um, myths about five myths about slavery, five myths about slavery. So uh, I the subject matter that I want to deal with is myths about slavery that we need to stop believing myths about slavery um we need to stop believing okay and we get into a deeper discussion into a lot of this history in this eight week online course uh that i teach but this is a fantastic article and i actually know the two african-american female historians who wrote this article and i have i have some other articles that i want to reference in this short period of time here uh, that we're here because I'm Gary to teach uh, this online class. It's normally on a Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So as soon as I finish uh, this broadcast, we're going to jump on and teach the class at my online school. But uh, no, the Civil War did not end slavery and the first Africans didn't arrive in America in 1619. So we hear these different myths, right, about slavery. Um, and, and this also ties into Juneteenth. And if you saw the broadcast that I did around Juneteenth, there were presentations that I did speaking at Juneteenth celebrations. And there's so much misinformation floating around about this history. It's really important to dispel these myths. OK, now this article is written by two African-American female historians that I know and have interviewed here on the African History Network show before. Dr. Dana Ramey, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dana, Dana Ramey Berry and Dr. Talitha LaFloria. And Dr. Talitha LaFloria's book, I just had it here. Uh, hold on, where's Talitha's book? She has a book dealing with uh, African American female women who were uh, uh, prisoners and like victims of the convict leasing system. And I think her book is right here. Hold on, let me show it to you. Because I've interviewed both these sisters on my show. So this is Dr. Talitha LaFloria's book, Chained and Silence Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South. Chained and Silence Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South. And um, Dr. Dana Ramey Berry, I have her book also, I forgot the name of it, but also she is in the uh, the book that Nate Parker put out dealing with the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1831. Dr. Dana, Dana Ramey Berry, this book right here. Um, the Birth of a Nation, Nat Turner and the Making of a Movement edited by Nate Parker. OK, so this is the book that Nate Parker put out along with his movie about the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1831 in Southampton County, Virginia. His book is called The Birth of a Nation, Nat Turner and the Making of a Movement, edited by Nate Parker. This is the official movie tie in. OK, so in this book, there's a historical uh, chapter. So it has interviews like with the cast members and background information, things like that. But in this book, there's a historical chapter which deals like with the real history of the Nat Turner Rebellion and what happened after the Nat Turner Rebellion. And in this chapter, this chapter is called The Unbroken Chain of Enslaved African Resistance and Rebellion. And it's written by Dr. Erica Armstrong Dunbar, another brilliant African-American female historian who I've had here on the show before, as well as Dr. Uh, Dana Ramey Berry. OK. So they wrote this chapter of this book. Okay, so if you saw the uh, 
movie, The Birth of a Nation, that Nat, that Nate Parker put out about the Nat Turner Rebellion, get this book also. I got this. I think I got this from Amazon.com. All right. But check your local African-American uh, book dealer as well first. OK, so let's look at uh, a few of these myths. And I have some other information also that I'm going to throw in some additional sources. So uh, they start out saying. Uh, only 8% of high school seniors can identify slavery as a central cause of the Civil War, according to a recent Southern Poverty Law Center survey. The average American has grown up believing a slew of myths. The average American has grown up believing a slew, a slew of myths about the institution of slavery. As scholars of slavery and its aftermath were identified, a few of the many misconceptions we have encountered in the classroom and in public spaces over the years. Okay, now this um, statistic right here, we've talked about this a number of times before on the African History Network show, right? Uh, that statistic comes from this study here from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And the name of this study is called Teaching Hard History American Slavery. Teaching Hard History American Slavery. And this is a 50, it's about a 52 page study that deals with how the history of slavery in this country is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country. OK. Um, and on the. When we look here at it, the uh, on the advisory board that helped put this together is um, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries who's a nephew of one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. And um, he is a associate professor of history at Ohio, at the Ohio State University and chair of the Teaching Hard History Advisory Board, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries. And we've had him here on the African History Network show before as well. OK, so he was the chair of the advisory board that put together this study. Now, you can get this study from uh, SPL, SPLC.org, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center.org, SPLC.org. And you can download it. I took it to, to a printer and got it printed up. It's called Teaching Hard History, American Slavery. OK. All right. So let's go back to this article. Um. So one of the first misconceptions, and I hear this all the time, and this ties into also the 1619 Project um, that we've talked about here on the show before. The first Africans came to America in 1619. OK, now, even though those Africans, those 20 and odd Africans on the White Lion pirate ship did come into uh, Virginia in uh, 1619. August 20th, 1619. Okay. And it come into point comfort that did happen, but Africans were here tens of thousands of years before that. And then also Africans were here in 1526 when the Spanish brought them in 1526 in the area uh, that's today, South Carolina and Georgia. But if we look at the article here, uh, it says U S history textbooks commonly introduced 1619, the year Africans arrived in America. This date has appeared in sources such as the Atlanta Journal Constitution and the Associated Press, and it and it has become even more entrenched in the pagination thanks to the New York Times Magazine 1619 project, project commemorating the anniversary of the 20 and odd uh, Negroes who landed at Point Comfort 400 years ago. And then, and then the class, uh, so the, the eight the eight week online class that I teach is called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. And we teach that on uh, now on Wednesday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, okay? And in the class, we go deep into um, a lot of this misinformation that's been fed to us in news stories has been fed to us um, through uh, in the educational system, et cetera. And this is one of the reasons why, even though there's misinformation with Juneteenth that's in like mainstream media, 
Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday is extremely important because that gives an opportunity to correct the misinformation on a national level, to really correct the misinformation uh, about this history, not just about Juneteenth, but Juneteenth is also directly connected to the history of slavery in this country. And it forces America to have a conversation, a national conversation about a history that Republicans are passing laws in their state legislatures, okay, to suppress the teaching of this history with these anti-critical race theory laws. Okay, so um, while this date is indeed significant to British arrival, and settlement. Africans came to America well earlier. Now, we, they, she deals with uh, the, the sisters, they talk about Juan Garrido, who comes into um, Florida with Juan Ponce de Leon in 1513, and Esteban or Estabanico uh, in, in 1528 here in uh, uh, New Mexico. Okay. But we, uh, we go back even before then, tens of thousands of years uh, before that as well. Now, because of their mobility and influence among the Spanish conquistadors, historians offer differing interpretations on whether they were ever enslaved, but at some point, both men were considered free. Another example is Isabel de, uh, de Overa, Overa, O L V E R A, who was a free woman of African descent, who in six in the year sixteen hundred went on an expedition to New Spain, uh, a region comprising present day New Mexico, Arizona, Florida, and other parts of uh, North and South America. Okay, and other parts of North and South America. Um, and uh, we know that uh, he's in uh, Estaba Nico. We know he's in Mexico City. He's also in uh, Florida as well, Florida. And we know that uh, Florida is a Spanish word in reference to flowers. And it's going to be Juan, Juan Ponce de Leon that gives Florida its name. The Spanish East Door Juan Ponce de Leon. Now, uh, so Isabel de Overa was a free woman of African descent who, in 1600, went on a went on an expedition to New Spain. Uh, this was a region comprising present-day New Mexico, Arizona, Florida, and other parts of North and South America, called New Spain. Okay, and we know that um, Arizona. Uh, um, Florida, New Mexico, uh, Colorado, Nevada, all that is going to be Spanish territory. Okay. Because, uh, and then when you have the Mexican American war of 1846 to 1848, at the end of that war, because of the treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the U S is going to get the territory that makes up California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, they get all of that land for mexico okay for about 15 million dollars now these stories too are important to u.s history they uh, they place the starting point of african-american history and freedom as well as enslavement and freedom as well as enslavement okay now let's go back even further she, now, so these sisters are correct these sisters are correct with this okay but but we got to go back even further and let's look quickly here at the uh, research from Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence. Okay, We have uh, running and rebroadcast here uh, on the African Network, the interview that I did with him on October 12th, um, 2021, and that's Columbus Day. That's known historically as Columbus Day. Okay. Um, um, well, let me rephrase that. What's celebrated as Columbus Day is the second Monday in October. OK, uh, October 12th. Uh, October 12th commemorates Columbus landing in the Bahamas. All right. When, when Columbus set sail August 3rd, 1492 
on the Nina and the Penta and the Santa Maria. OK, and he's and he's financed by Spain. He's backed by uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And he's trying to uh, prove that you can uh, sail west to uh, go east. And he's trying to go to uh, Asia. He's trying to go to the Orient. All right. So. When we look at where Columbus goes on his four voyages, he never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. He never comes to the land we call the United States of America. The closest that he comes here is Cuba, which is 40 miles away, uh, about 90 miles away. Cuba, which is about 90 miles away. Now, it's important to understand. We'll, we'll go back to Dr. David M. Hotep in just a second, but all this history is connected, okay? Because Columbus is extremely important to understand in this history because the Spanish were the second ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. The, the Portuguese are the first ones involved in 1441. The Spanish are, are right behind them. Great Britain doesn't get involved until 1562 with uh, Sir John Hawkins, all right? And then we know these British colonies that become the United States of America, they, they're set up uh, starting in 1607 with, with Virginia, okay? So you've got uh the transatlantic slave trade going uh, uh over 100 years uh before close to close to something like 150 years before that right B before 1607 so columbus helps to lay the foundation of slavery racism capitalism and the exploitation of indigenous people but he never comes to the land we call the united states of america all right uh, he, he, Columbus was convinced that he would find a new and lucrative sea route to the Orient by sail, sailing west to find silk, tea, spices, gold, etc. This was big business in the 15th century, the 1400s. He intended to chart a western sea route to China, India, and the fabled gold and spice islands of Asia. Instead, he landed in the Bahamas, becoming the first European to explore the Americas since the Vikings set up colonies in Greenland and Newfoundland during the 10th century, okay? So we pronounce it usually Newfoundland, okay? Um, especially, I think, probably like in Canada, because I, I live right near the Canadian border. I'm in downtown Detroit. I live right near the Canadian border. Um, but it's found new found land new found land it was new to them okay A african people were already in north america now europeans lost their trading route to asia because of the fall of constantinople to the ottoman turks and europe lost its popular trading route the ottoman turks capture constantinople and thus divert the trade in eastern european slaves away from the mediterranean to islamic markets the Italians increasingly looked to North Africa as their source for slaves. OK, so this is around 1453 uh, common era. And he never uh, Columbus never found that uh, sea route, that that direct water route uh, going west to east that he was looking for. OK, he never he never found it. So it's important to look at where Columbus traveled on his four voyages because those uh island nations that that uh, uh columbus conquers and that we hear about oftentimes and some and some people go to travel and go to on on vacations like jamaica okay places like this they have never recovered for, from what happened to them over 500 years ago being conquered by spain and then others were then conquered after being conquered by spain then they were conquered by either the french or the british or what have you OK, so you have um, Jamaica. OK, Jamaica uh, gets uh, conquered by the uh, uh, British in uh, it's about 1697 after Spain, after Spain conquers Jamaica in 1494 under Columbus. Jamaica then becomes a colony of, uh, of the British in 1697. OK, we know about Haiti, which is on the island of Hispaniola in Haiti. Uh, what what the French call Saint Dominique, that was the western third of the island of Hispaniola. Okay, so his the the, the island of Hispaniola is conquered uh, in in uh, basically means the Spanish island. Okay, 
uh, this is what uh, Columbus called it, uh, his, uh, pretty much Hispaniola, uh, La Isla Espana, something like that. Uh, I've got the correct, the exact uh, language for it, but um, it translates as it translates as the Spanish island. Okay, so what happens is, is um, um, the French take over the western third of uh, of uh, the island of Hispaniola uh, from the from the Spanish. Okay, so you're going to have colonizer after colonizer conquer these lands, exploiting them, uh, enslaving the indigenous people, enslaving African people, raping the land, extracting the mineral wealth out of the land, et cetera, setting up uh, sugarcane plantations, things like this, especially in these tropical areas, they're going to set up sugarcane plantations. Okay, so that that's why it's important to really understand this history and the connection between christopher columbus and the transatlantic slave trade all right now let me go back to uh dr david m hotel quickly and i have to teach this class if you want to register for this uh online class it's an eight-week online class we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded it's called ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade with a didn't teach you in school um We'll post a link here. You can register here. We also have the information on the homepage of our website, uh, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We do the classes live. live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it. Any year from now, two years from now, you can still you can go back and uh, watch the entire class. Okay. So at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We have the information there. We have a bundle pack because you uh, in the bundle pack, you can register for the second class that I teach on Tuesdays, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. The second class is um, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. So we had a great class yesterday. Uh, just click right here, register here to register. And uh, on the um, the bundle pack. We have the bundle pack also. The bundle pack is $130. That's over $300 value. Click right here to register here uh, for the bundle pack uh, where you get both classes and bonus content from me, bonus lectures, things like that from me as well. Okay, so Dr. David M. Hotep, who's a friend of mine, I've interviewed him probably 13 times or so. Um, his, his first book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, came out in 2011 on page uh, 14. Now, his book is backed up by 713 footnotes, okay, and, seven, and it's backed up by seven peer-reviewed articles, which is the height of academia. But um, uh, on page 14 of his book, he deals with a discovery made in Allendale County, South Carolina in uh, 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear, okay, and they found 13 di different types of evidence that fairly document an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years, 13 different types of evidence, not one or two bones here or there, 13 different types of evidence that fairly document an African presence in this country that we call today the United States of America or many Native Americans call Turtle Island that dates back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, um, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, they found genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. Uh, they found uh, li uh, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting uh, this evidence. And if you look at the article from Dr. Albert, uh, look at the article about the discovery that Dr. Albert Goodyear made. Uh, this comes from ScienceDaily.com. Now, ScienceDaily.com is a scientific website. They have a lot of scientific discoveries, arche archaeological discoveries, things like that. Uh, the name of this article from two, from November 18, 2004 is called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. And here's a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. Dr. Albert Goodyear, he's a white archaeologist from the University of South Carolina, and he uh, is a head of the mainstream archaeological establishment. 
and he is at odds with the mainstream archaeological establishment showing that humans uh, homo sapiens were here in this land we call the United States of America tens of thousands of years before mainstream archaeology says they were, uh, which was the Clovis culture uh, discovery that goes back about 13,000, 14,000 years ago that was found in New Mexico. And they say these were Native Americans and this is the oldest um, uh, evidence of humans here in, in this country. No. African people were here tens of thousands of years before that. Now, the summary, th this is the summary of the article from sciencedaily.com. Radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where Africans, uh, where artifacts were unearthed last May. So it'd be May uh, 2004, last May, along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Well, who were these humans? Okay. They weren't Europeans. They weren't Asians. Who were these humans? Okay. They would have, the African people have the oldest DNA on the planet. And these humans that they're talking about, these were the Khoisan, okay? The Khoisan are the short-statured Africans who come from Southern Africa. And uh, in an October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Now, here are two Khoisan women. These are the short statured Africans. The Khoisan live mainly in Southern Africa in territory spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, hunters and gatherers, known as the Sans people, S-A-N-S, and keepers of the livestock known as the Khoi Khoi people. The Khoisan language includes the distinctive click sounds, the distinctive click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. OK, if you read the article from AtlantaBlackStar.com, five ethnic groups that prove the first humans were black. They talk about the Khoisan in there. And the click language is also in uh, the language of Isikosa. And Isikosa is the language spoken in the film uh, Black Panther. OK, so the film Black Panther and you, you hear them speaking the language and uh, Ishikosa also has has the click sounds in it as well, because we talk about the film Black Panther uh, in the class because the film Black Panther relates to African history, African culture, African language, African spiritual systems as well. And uh, Ishikosa is a Bantu language. OK, now Bantu languages are a group of some 500 languages belonging to the Bantoid subgroup of the Banu Congo branch of the Niger Congo language family. The Bantu languages are spoken in a very large area, including most of Africa, from southern Cameroon eastward to Kenya and southward to the southernmost tip of the continent. Twelve Bantu languages are spoken by more than five million people, including Rundi, Rwanda, Shona, Kosa, or what's actually called Isikosa, okay, I-S-I-X-H-O-S-A, Isikosa and Zulu or Amazulu. Swahili, or properly Kiswahili, which is spoken by 5 million people as a mother tongue and some 30 million as a second language, is a Bantu lingua franca important in both commerce and literature. Okay, so Britannica.com has some good basic information on uh, uh, Bantu languages. What are Bantu languages? All right. Okay. So when we look at this information, we're going to see that all of this 
is connected. All of this history, all this information, the languages, culture, this is all connected. All right. Okay. So we have uh, the first glaring fact. The first glaring myth is that uh, Africans first came to this land in 1619. No, we did not first come here conquered and shackled in chains. In all actuality, this was our land stolen from us. And the sooner that African Americans really understand this real history, to understand that we were here in this land before anybody else. Now, this, this does not mean the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. That's not what I'm saying. Because oftentimes people will totally misunderstand that because they're only dealing with the last hundred years of history and not the last 50,000 years of history. I'm not saying the transatlantic slave. Yes, the transatlantic slave trade did happen. But African people were here in this land for tens of thousands of years before the transatlantic slave trade happened. So you have to understand that chronology of history. OK, so another myth. That we hear in uh, we know. A, a, a lot of that myth was uh, partly, not 100%, but um, when Malcolm X in 1963 talked about the house slave and the field slave, right? This gets repeated a lot, but it's much more complex than that. And slave people who worked in the house had easier lives. It's, it's much more complex than this. Uh, in a 1963 speech, Malcolm X strongly separated enslaved people who worked in the house from those who worked in the fields, claiming that the former group, okay, the uh, the house slaves enjoyed greater privileges and comforts, and that some even and that some even identified with their enslavers. Okay, now texts designed to teach uh, children about slavery also assert that people forced into domestic labor had more comfortable and pleasant lives than those forced into agricultural labor. So those domestic labor, those that worked in the house and cooked the food and washed the clothes and things like this. OK, uh, you have texts that books and things like this designed to teach children about slavery also as often assert that people forced into domestic labor had more comfortable and pleasant lives than those forced into agricultural labor. OK, but the distinction is not that simple. The, the real history is much more complicated. While a few of the very largest plantations had entirely separate labor pools, says historian Greg Downs, in most households, laborers moved between tasks depending on their age or the season, whether it's winter, spring, fall, or summer. And working indoors had its own, had its own physical and psychological hardships. Working indoors had its own physical and psychological hardships. Enslaved people were on call 24 hours a day, mostly on their feet, and in close proximity to their enslavers, which led to greater scrutiny of their work, according to historian Deborah Gray White, some of this labor included helping uh, their enslavers uh, dress, bathe, style their hair, and fan flies, in addition to cooking, cleaning, and running er errands. Intimate, intimate interactions involving personal touch and knowledge of people's innermost lives. In these settings, writes historian uh, Thavolia uh, Glymph, Glymph, G-L-Y-M-P-H, domestic laborers often experienced physical and sexual abuse. Because of this close proximity, in, in these close proximity settings, domestic laborers often experience physical and sexual abuse. Now, um, another myth is that now, now the other thing that's important to understand is that a lot, a lot of these so-called house slaves, a lot of them ended up being very valuable when it came to um, the Civil War 
because you're going to have many of them who become spies for the union during the civil war and because they're in close proximity to white people and because they're serving the food and they're there at the dinner table when uh members of the confederacy are, are meeting and things like this because they're getting information they're feeding this information to the union to defeat their slave masters because because we wanted to be free so it wasn't just the uh approximately two hundred thousand african-american men who uh fight in the civil war and fight on behalf of the army and the, and the navy uh in in the union uh on behalf of the union but it, but you also have spies who many of them were house slaves spies on behalf of the union who were slaves spies on behalf of the union okay and they're working to, to defeat their masters as well okay now another myth is that slavery was limited to the south and i was just on the tammy mack show on uh tammy mack business of being black show i was a panelist on there um that was at last monday that was uh october 3rd i was on october 3rd and we were dealing with that's on the fox soul tv network and we were dealing with um is it time to get over slavery is it time to get over slavery and i was on with two black conservatives who didn't most of them most of the time they didn't know what the hell they were talking about so i had to school them on history and america has never confronted for a sustained period of time really it's history of slavery and legacy of slavery you had some attempts during the reconstruction era but reconstruction only lasted about 12 years and then it came to an end because of the compromise of 1877 and the reconstruction era just like just like um the freedman's bank okay which was set up by congress in uh, 1865 it was um uh, it was not properly managed there was corruption regarding the freedman's bank and uh towards the end frederick douglas is going to be put in charge of the freedman's bank he and he puts in thousands of dollars of his own money into the bank to try to, to to keep the bank solvent to try to prop the bank up but it finally collapses in 1874 and african americans lose about 2.9 million dollars in deposits okay in in uh 1874 dollars 2.9 million i have no idea what that is today all right and this was a bank that was created by the federal government to, to uh so african americans could deposit their money into the bank that they're that they're earning from working and things like this uh deposit into the bank create savings etc then you had the freedmen's bureau which was created in 1865 the u.s bureau of freedmen refugees and abandoned lands and the freedmen's bureau was designed to help the newly freed slaves uh adjust to new life help them uh, negotiate labor contracts set up schools uh one of the things that the freedmen's bureau did was help reunite the family help lost loved ones reconnect husbands and wives and things like this reconnect etc and they also helped destitute white people they and, and they would help with uh, uh health care and all different types of things the the, the u.s bureau of freedmen refugees in the band of lands it was originally designed to only last a year by Congress and then it was extended but it only lasted uh something like uh 10 years or something like that the Freedmen's Bureau okay if you enslave people for 246 years how the hell are you gonna give them assistance for only about 10 years that makes no sense if you if you have people enslaved for 246 years you make money off of the 262 skills trades and crafts that they have and then you turn them loose largely with no land no compensation majority of them are illiterate things like this and you give them assistance for 10 years in the land that you allocated to about 40,000 families and it was only 400,000 acres of coastal land in South Carolina Florida and Georgia and that was known as special field order number 15 or what's commonly called 40 acres and a mule that did not apply to all 
former slaves. It was 400,000 acres of coastal land that was divided into plots of up to, or lots of up to 40 acres. And it goes to about 40,000 African-American families. Well, that land is going to be taken back after a couple of years by President Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Lincoln after Lincoln's assassinated, his vice president, who was who who was a Democrat, who was actually a Democrat and from Tennessee. And he was sympathetic to the former slave owners and the traitors of the Confederacy. So almost all that land is taken back from African-Americans and given back to the back, given back to the traitors. OK, how you all like this broadcast? How's everybody doing? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. You can post your comments here. OK, we've got Micah. Micah Hahn, Colin, Stephen, Kush Boss, John Hill, Ron Green, just a few of the people watching. You can register for this eight week online course uh, that I teach because um, as soon as we jump off here, we're going as soon as we finish here, we're going to class. Um, so normally it's uh, Wednesday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school today. We're going to uh, start a little later. But this is an eight week online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. OK, so this is just a preview of um, of that class. Just, this is just a brief sample of some of the type of information that we deal with in the class. And uh, you can uh, we also have the information at our, uh, on the home page of our website the african history network.com the african history network.com and uh also you can click on uh courses on the menu uh click on uh courses and we have the information there as well okay so you scroll down the home page of our website we have it here uh with the with the classes classes on sale 80 dollars regularly 130 dollars we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded you can watch on demand you don't have to be present in class and even after the course is over with you can go back and watch the entire class okay and we have the bundle pack of both classes here because the second class that i teach on tuesdays is uh from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968. okay let's continue here I want to go back to this article from uh, the Washington Post. And for th those just joining us, we're dealing with myths about slavery. We need to stop believing myths about slavery. We need to stop believing. So this is a big one here. And this kind of came up uh, when I was on the Tammy Mack show, because one of the black conservatives who was a, this ultra MAGA guy, big black Trump supporter, just just dumb as hell, to be honest with you. Um. He said the Emancipation Proclamation freed 90 percent of the slaves in the country. No, it didn't. The Emancipation Proclamation, number one, was a military strategy to bring the South back into the Union. Number two, uh, the South has seceded from the Union and set up their own government. OK, known as the Confederacy, the United States of the United, uh, the Confederate States of America. And the U.S. had no authority to uh dictate to them anything the, the u.s had no authority to free free their slaves so what happens is is maryland and when you actually read the emancipation proclamation maryland missouri kentucky and delaware were exempt because they were border states maryland did not end slavery until november 1st 1864 which is almost two years after the emancipation proclamation but another myth about slavery is that slavery was limited to the South. No, it was not. At one point, all of the 13 colonies had slavery. Now, when people think about slavery in the United States, they often picture large cotton plantations in the Deep South. They often picture large cotton plantations in the Deep South. Uh, one popular textbook claims that while cotton uh quote enriched enriched planters in the south as well as bankers and ship owners in the north the latter 
the bankers and ship owners in the north still relied on a free labor system still relied on the free labor system now similarly the college board's curriculum for advanced placement u.s history states that quote the north's expanding manufacturing uh economy relied on free labor in contrast to uh the southern economy's dependence on slave labor okay the north the uh the north's expanding manufacturing economy relied on free labor in contrast to the uh southern economy's dependence on slave labor but these accounts which simplistically oppose free northern states with slave southern states neglect to mention the long-standing presence of enslaved labor in the north because at one point all 13 colonies have slavery slavery touched nearly every corner of this country northern communities supported and benefited from southern slavery through the shipbuilding textile and shoemaking industries the shipbuilding textiles and shoemaking industries in rhode island alone traders shipped uh more than 100,000 african captives to the caribbean and american colonies according to people not property and online documentary plantations along the uh, connecticut delaware and hudson rivers relied on enslaved uh, african workers to produce wheat and process it into flour okay to produce wheat and process it into flour slavery was widespread at universities the maryland jesuits who founded and ran georgetown uh, georgetown university so enslaved laborers to pay off debts to keep the school in operation so that information came out a few years ago we talked about that on the african history network when that when that news became public and early presidents of harvard university brought enslaved labor to work on campus enslaved african laborers built uh, the structure in lower manhattan for which wall street is named okay so and when you look at um just for just for quick reference here if we look at this article here from the bbc just just for quick reference because we, we'll just be here a few more minutes how you all like this type of information give us a thumbs up give us a heart give us a like this article comes from bbc.com okay this is from the bbc the hidden links between slavery and wall street okay the hidden links between slavery and wall street this is from august 29th 2019 right around the time of that 400 year anniversary okay of august 20th 1619 you know the 400 year anniversary of august 20th 1619 so uh the art i'm gonna skip over some of this uh let's go down to by some estimates um by some estimates new york received 40 percent of u.s cotton revenue new york new york received 40 percent of u.s cotton revenue through money its financial firms shipping businesses and insurance companies earned okay but scholars differ on just how direct a line can be drawn between slavery and modern economic practices in the united states um let me see here p uh slavery thrived under colonial. okay so people in non-slave areas britain and uh free united states routinely did business with slave owners and slave commerce says gavin wright professor emeritus of economic history at stanford university but he says the uniqueness of slavery's economic contribution 
has been exaggerated by some. Slavery thrived under colonial rule. British and Dutch settlers relied on the slave people to help establish farms and build the new towns and cities that would eventually become the United States. Now, so we know that the, 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 the Dutch were here also. We often hear about the British because these were British colonies, right? But we don't hear a lot oftentimes about the Dutch presence that was here. And it's going to be the Dutch. So if we look at, for instance, we look at this um, article here from um, AtlantaBlackStar.com. This one here. This, now, this is called Seven Eye-Opening Facts on How Wall Street Was Built and Created Slavery. Seven Eye-Opening Facts uh, on How Wall Street Was Built and Created Slavery. This is from December 30th, 2014. And this is some of the some of the type of information we do within the class, but we just deal with a lot more history than this. Okay, twice is eight weeks, and we do it thousands of years of history. Uh, if we just look here at fact number one, enslaved Africans actually built the wall that gave Wall Street its name. Enslaved Africans actually built the wall that gave Wall Street its name. And let me see if I can zoom in on this. Um, can we, okay, yeah, let's increase the size of this. Okay, now New York City was a Dutch settlement known as New Amsterdam. New Amsterdam in the Dutch colonial province called New Netherland during much of the 17th century or the 1600s. Now, through the Dutch West India Company, because Europeans are organizing themselves into slave trading companies that are financed by banks, financed by wealthy people, financed by uh, royalty, etc. So you have the Dutch East India Company, the Dutch West India Company, the Brandenburg Company, uh, etc. But through the Dutch West India Company, the Dutch utilized the labor of enslaved Africans who were first brought to the colony around 1627. The enslaved Africans built the wall that gives Wall Street its name. The enslaved Africans built the wall that gave Wall Street its name, forming the northern boundary of the colony that warded off resisting natives who wanted their land back. OK, now some. Uh, so from its creation, the wall was the hedge ensuring the survival of whites and white supremacy. This is where Wall Street gets its name from. Um, and then we know that you had slave auctions uh, there on Wall Street also. OK, Wall Street initially was the site of slave auctions. Slavery became the backbone of New York's economic prosperity in the 1700s to normalize this massive trade in human beings in 1711 new york officials established a slave market on wall street slave auctions were held at wall street uh, slave auctions were held at wall street selling enslaved africans as property to traders wanting to buy them wall street was also the marketplace where uh, owners could hire out their enslaved uh, Africans by the day or week. Okay, so check check out this uh, piece here from AtlantaBlackStar.com. Seven eye-opening facts on how Wall Street was built and created via slavery. That's by uh, Nick Mills for uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com. Okay, now if we go back quickly and then we'll get out of here in, in just a minute because I have to teach this class. Um, if we, uh, I want to go back to the uh, piece here from, uh, what is this here? Uh, let's go back to the article here from the BBC, just a second here. From the BBC. So slavery thrived under colonial rule british and uh dutch settlers relied on enslaved people to help establish farms and build the new towns and cities 
that would eventually become the United States. Enslaved people were brought to work on cotton, sugar, and tobacco plantations. So the, so the five major crops that you're going to see, because tobacco was king before cotton became king, okay? Tobacco, I know we hear a lot about cotton, but cotton is going to become a uh, king, uh, even though they were producing cotton, but it's going to really become king um, after uh, really, really, uh, right around 1793 and after it was 1794 when Eli Whitney creates the cotton gin because what this is going to do is is going to um, drastically reduce um, the labor cost of cotton and drastically increase the production of cotton because the cotton gin was a device that picks the seeds out of cotton. OK, and it was much more efficient than a human being picking the seeds out of cotton. Then in then in um, 1803. Then in then in uh, 1803, you have uh, the Louisiana Purchase, OK, of 1803, which doubles the territory of the um, of the United States and the U.S. gets 828,000 square miles of land for less than five cents an acre, okay? And they, so they get this land from France, the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, and the U.S. is going to carve out about 13, about, sorry, about 15 uh, states out of this territory that they get from uh, France. And this is going to, now even though they kept a balance between uh, free states and slaveholding states, okay? What this did was this gave the U.S. more fertile land to grow crops, which then increased the need for more African slave labor. And the, France has to sell this land because Napoleon and France are almost going bankrupt fighting against the Haitians during the Haitian Revolution. So they sell this land here um, uh, for $15 million to, uh, to raise money. OK, so the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 brought into the uh, United States about 820,000 square miles of land of territory from France, thereby doubling the size of the young republic, the United States. What was known at the time as the Louisiana Territory stretched from the Mississippi River in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the West and the Gulf of Mexico in the South, uh, in the South to the Canadian border in the North. Part, of, part or all of 15 states were eventually created, part or all of 15 states were eventually uh, created Hold on, let me go back here, okay. Uh, eventually created from the land deal, which is considered one of the most important achievements of Thomas Jefferson's presidency. OK, and here's a map of the United States showing the Louisiana territory. You see that in the middle of of uh, the nation. OK, um, in green. Uh, now. Let me go back to this here. OK, let's go back to this article here from the BBC. Uh, this article from the BBC deals with uh, the hidden links between slavery and Wall Street. So enslaved African people were brought to work on the cotton, sugar and tobacco plantations. The crops uh, they grew were sent to Europe or to northern colonies. The crops they grew were sent to Europe or to northern colonies to be turned into uh, finished products, okay? So even though, even after most of the Northern states abolished slavery, they still benefit from slavery because you have a lot of the textile mills that are in the, that are up North. So all, all of America is gonna benefit from slavery and what Africans produce in the 262 skills, trades and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619, 1865. Now those finished goods 
were used to fund trips to Africa to obtain more uh, Africans and, and make them slaves who would, who would then traffic back to America. The triangular trade route was profitable for investors. Now to raise the money to start, many future plantation owners turned to capital markets in London selling debt that was used to purchase boats, goods, and eventually African people, okay? Selling debt, they turned to capital markets in London, selling debt that was used to purchase boats, goods, ships, goods, and eventually African people. Okay, now, just for the sake of this, is just a couple of parts that I want to look at here. Um, now, by the mid 19th century, exports of raw cotton accounted for more than half of U.S. overseas shipments. By the mid 1800s, exports of raw cotton accounted for more than half of U.S. overseas shipments. What wasn't sold abroad was sent to textile mills in northern states including Massachusetts and Rhode Island to be turned into fabric. So even though Massachusetts and Rhode Island had already abolished slavery, they're still in Massachusetts abolished slavery right around 1780. They're still benefiting from slavery. They're still benefiting from the cotton that enslaved Africans produced who were in the Southern states. Now, the money Southern plantation owners earn cannot be kept under mattresses or behind loose floorboards. American banks accepted their deposits and counted enslaved people as assets when assessing a person's wealth. Okay, also, they were a lot of, of uh, plantation owners, they would use their African slaves as collateral. OK, they used as their African slaves as collateral to get loans from banks. also in recent years, U.S. banks have made public apologies for the role they played in slavery. In 2005, J.P. Morgan Chase, currently the biggest uh, bank in the United States, admitted that two of its subsidiaries, Citizens Bank and Canal Bank in Louisiana, accepted enslaved African people as collateral for loans, accepted enslaved African people as collateral for loans. If plantation owners defaulted on loan payments, the banks took over ownership of these African slaves. Now, J.P. Morgan Chase was not alone. The predecessors that made up Citibank, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo are among a list of well-known U.S. financial firms that benefited from the African slave trade. Now, uh, I just want to jump down here to this other, because I'm looking at my notes that I have on this article. So Professor Becker points out that while cities like Boston, Massachusetts, never played a large role in the slave trade, they benefited from the connections to slave-driven economies. They benefited from the connections to slave driven economies. New England merchants made money selling timber and I, not timber lands, not timberland boots, timber, okay, from trees, timber. New England merchants made money selling timber and ice to the South and to the Caribbean. In turn, Northern merchants bought raw cotton and sugar. Because one of the things that, um, see, one of the myths is that, oh, well, all most of the slaves, they were just in the South. So, you know, it, yeah, at one point uh, you had slavery in all 13 colonies, but they're going to, they, you know, the, the con it, they're going to abolish slavery in the North and it's just going to be in the South. And slavery didn't have anything to do with the North. That's not true. No, the North benefited from slavery. OK, and then when we talk about the Emancipation Proclamation, because one of the black conservatives that was on the Tammy Mack show, he said, oh, when the Emancipation Proclamation 
uh, was issued. 90% of uh, the slaves were freed. No, they weren't. Let's look at history.com. Emancipation Proclamation. Now, you, you should you should read the actual Emancipation Proclamation. This is what I said on the Tammy Mack show on, on the Fox Soul TV network when I was on October 3rd. Because I've read the actual Emancipation Proclamation. You can go to archives.gov and read it, U.S. National Archives, or you can go to loc.gov. Because when you read it, it has all these exceptions in there. Like I said, Maryland, Missouri, Kentucky, and Delaware, these were border states that stayed loyal to the Union. They were allowed to keep their slaves, okay? So on September 22nd, now the other thing that people don't understand is that the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation was issued September 22nd, 1862. They just talk about the one January 1st, 1863. The preliminary Emancipation Proclamation delivered, issued uh, September 22nd, 1862 was an ultimatum to the southern states that seceded from the union that if you don't come back to the union by january 1st 1863 your slaves are going to be free because the goal of the war was to bring the south back into the union not to free the slaves the goal of the war was to bring the south back into the union because the south was the economic engine of america but after the Emancipation Proclamation, and as time goes on, the goal changes and it becomes evident that the slaves are going to be the slaves are going to be freed. So, uh, OK, which declared that as of January 1st, 1863, all enslaved people in the in the states currently engaged in rebellion against the union shall be then thenceforward and forever free okay it only applied to the states in rebellion against the union also the territories in rebellion against the union the emancipation proclamation lincoln did not actually free all of the approximately four million men women and children held in slavery in the united states when he signed the formal emancipation proclamation the following january the document now, this is the History Channel. This is the look at it. This is history.com. History.com is the official website of the History Channel. Okay, this article is uh this is by the editors of history.com. This is this is white people telling you that the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves. The document applied only to enslaved people in the Confederacy and not to those in the border states that remained loyal to the union. This is what I was saying. But at the same time, the union has no authority to dictate to the Confederacy any what to do because they separated and set up their own government. And, and this is why you needed a 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution ratified December 6, 1865, adopted December 18, 1865, to amend the U.S. Constitution because the U.S. Constitution sanctioned and legalized slavery. Okay, so read this right here, because we talk about this a lot in, in my second class, uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We really don't. Um, okay, can you all hear me? You should be able to hear me. We really don't we really don't talk about the Emancipation Proclamation that much in ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Uh, the only reason why is because we stopped right around 1800 or so with this class. And then with the second class that I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, we teach that on Tuesdays. We focus in on that period of time especially from 1865 to 1968, but we start in uh, 1800, looking at the 1800 U.S. Census, and then looking at the uh, Louisiana Purchase of 1803 and the Haitian Revolution, because those two events are connected. Those two events are directly related. Okay, how you all like this topic of information? Let us know here on the thread of the broadcast. Are you learning anything? Let us know, give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like on this broadcast. Okay, now if we go back to the article from the Washington Post, slavery, slavery touched nearly every corner of this country. Slavery touched nearly every corner of this country. Northern communities supported and benefited from Southern slavery 
uh, through the shipbuilding, textile, and shoemaking industries. Okay. Now, if we look at the um, the last fact here that they lay out, and there's there's more myths, but this is what we're gonna wrap up with here because I teach this class. Uh, women were not as involved in slave owning as men were. Women were not as involved in slave owning as men were. Okay, so the movie Gone with the Wind is part of this whole propaganda campaign known as the Lost Cause, which is a, a campaign of something like the last 150 years or so to really rewrite the history of slavery, show these images of happy slaves and, and, and rewrite the history uh, whereas the secession from the Union and the Confederacy, it wasn't about maintaining slavery, it's about states' rights. And a lot of these movies like to show the happy slaves, things like this. This is something that Gone with the Wind does. The 1939 blockbuster Gone with the Wind cemented the myth of the essentially innocent Southern belle, Scarlett O'Hara, who only passively benefited from slavery. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, historians who studied female slave holders tended to portray them as ambivalent about a role inherited from their fathers or husbands, making the best of a situation over which they had no control, making the best of a situation over which they had no control. In fact, white women actively participated in the institution of slavery. In the book, and we've, we've talked about it here a number of times here on the African History Network, um, in the book, they were her property, white women as slave owners in the American South, historian, Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers, who's a, a professor in um, uh, California. And let me pull up this article here um, from AtlantaBlackStar.com because they have an article. article about her i think that's when i first found out about her let's see here okay so this article from, from atlanta um, research by female professor reveals star telling truth the white and a slave on. We'll pull that up here in just a second. Okay, so historian Professor E. Jones, uh, Stephanie uh, E. Jones shows that white had a deep economic investment. White women had a deep economic investment in slavery and exercised uh, extraordinary control over the enslaved people in their household. Many learned this practice from birth, receiving uh, enslaved people's gifts, receive, receiving enslaved Africans as when they were children or even infants. Women bought and sold people at auction and successfully sued their male family members for control doors. White women supervised plantations and brutally punished their human property, quote unquote property. One mistress crushed the jaw of eight year old Henrietta King under the weight of her rocking chair because Henrietta had taken a piece of candy. The woman saved uh, Harriet Jacobs uh, spit in the kettles and pans to keep her from eating leftover scraps. Okay, so uh, check this check this article here. Five myths about slavery, uh, written by two brilliant African American female historians who interviewed before on the African History Network show, uh, Dr. Dana, uh, Dana Ramey Berry and Dr. Talitha uh, Lafleur. I just talked to Talitha um, about a week or so ago because I was asking her if she had seen. Uh, 
uh, the woman king yet because I wanted to bring on the show. We did the fantastic interview with Professor Jane Small about the woman king. Uh, but I wanted to know if she had seen uh, if she had seen Okay. Uh, and then this article here, hold on, I got to refresh. Let me see. Can you all hear me okay? Let me refresh the screen just one second here. Uh, how am I coming through? Can you all hear me testing? Your... Okay. Let me refresh the screen right quick because it's, uh, okay, it looks like it's cleared up. How am I coming through? Just a second. Let me refresh the screen. Stand by. Okay, we're back. All right, so I'm gonna post a link again here. You can register for this eight week online class that I teach on uh, normally on Wednesdays, uh, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're running behind schedule today. So as soon as I end this broadcast, I'm about to teach the class. So you can join us at our online school. Class is on sale, $80, regularly $130. And um, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it any time. This, this, this is the article that I wanted to show you here. This is the last one. Uh, this is from AtlantaBlackStar.com. Research by black female professor reveals startling truth that white women made up 40% of slave owners. This is from May 25th, 2019 by Kirsten Willis. I talked about this article when it came out. We talked about it here on the show. Um, a set of data uncovered by University of California Berkeley professor reveals Southern white women played a heavier role in the enslavement of Africans than previously thought. Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers, an associate professor of history at the university, combed through data from 1850 and 1860 census and revealed that white women made up around 40% of slave owners. Here's a, here's a picture of Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers. There's some uh, videos on YouTube uh, of her doing lectures as well that you could check out. So this is a brilliant system, okay? Uh, the findings help uh, Jones Rogers compile her book, They Were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South. Okay, so you can check this out uh, as well. Okay. Um, in her book, Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers explained that white women's involvement in slavery comes from family as their slave owning parents, quote, typically gave their daughters more enslaved people than land. As their slave owning parents, quote, typically gave their daughters more enslaved people than land um and history.com has information the, the the official website of the history channel what this means because she's quoted by the history channel also okay what this means is that their very identities as white southern women are tied to the actual or the possible ownership of other people uh, Professor, Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers said, according to history.com. Okay, so uh, check out this article as well. All right. So we uh, we posted a link here. You can register for the classes, and it's uh, in the thread of the broadcast. It's also on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com theafricanhistorynetwork.com so you can go to our website and scroll down you see information about the african history network show i'm on live sundays 9 p.m to 11 p.m eastern standard time now sometimes during the week like today i'm on live but we're definitely on live usually every sunday 9 p.m to 11 p.m eastern standard time with new with, with a live broadcast a new show okay and you can support us through uh paypal and cash app we have the information here dial sign the ahn show through cash app just click on the link and it takes you to uh our cash app uh, um cash app code okay you can scan the barcode 
you could uh, scan it because it's now working because it was uh, down for um, it was giving us an error message for a week, but it's up and running now. So that's a good thing. All right. So we have the information here. You scroll down. We have the, the interview I did with Professor James Small dealing with the woman king and the real history of the West African kingdom of Dahomey. That's on YouTube because uh, the original interview that's been uh, viewed over, over 50,000 times on YouTube. And then you come down. So we have the information here for the uh, bundle pack of classes. You get both classes on sale for one hundred thirty dollars. That's an over three hundred dollar value because it's bonus content that you get from me and bonus lectures in digital format. If you've taken any of my online classes in the past, uh, you can email us at AHN show at the African History Network dot com or email us through the website. Just click on contact the African History Network uh, on the menu and email us and you'll get a 50 percent discount on the bundle pack. If you've taken any of uh, my online classes in the past, I've, I've been teaching uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding transatlantic slave trade since 2017. So I created the whole both of these curriculums, pulled together all the content. So click right here for register here for the bundle or if you just want to register for one class, click here, register here and take you to the next page and then click on enroll. Uh, you can do debit card, credit card, PayPal, cash app. Uh, what have you. OK, so we'll get you taken care of. All right, we'll post the link here as well. So how do you all like this type of information? Did you all learn anything? Let me know here on the uh, thread of the broadcast. And I got to get out of here because we have to teach this class now. So the classes are Tuesdays and Wednesdays, normally 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right. And be sure to check us out live on Sundays, 9 p.m., 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then on Fridays, uh, 6 p.m. to um, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Yeah, I'm on uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, as well. I'm a panelist each Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered. So download download the Black Star Media app. You can watch there or or on Roland's uh, Facebook and YouTube channels. Uh, Roland S. Martin on Facebook and YouTube. OK, so hope you learned a lot today and I um, uh, hope to see you in class as well. Remember, right now, let's correct wrong behaviors. Not over till we win. We're kind of forever and we'll talk to you next time. Peace.